to you all as we come together to worship and praise God. To have faith is to be sure of the things that we hope for, to be certain of the things we cannot see. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end.
let us pray. God, our loving Heavenly Father, this is the day that you have made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we praise you for this day and for all that you have so lovingly done for us, we remember, Lord, that you have also called us to follow you as disciples in our lives together and as individuals through worship, prayer and mission. We ask, Father, that you will give us the strength and enthusiasm to do as you would want us to. Forgive us, Heavenly Father, for our wasted moments, spent selfishly or just filling time, for the hurtful moments caused by our words or actions, for the thoughtless moments when we are lacking in love, for the destructive moments when we let our anger take hold, and Lord, for the missed moments when we fail to act, allowing ourselves to be overcome by hesitation and doubt. Father, help us now and every moment to try to live as Jesus lived, full of love for all those around us. We ask these things in his name and pray as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first reading is taken from Psalm 118, verses 14 to 29. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of righteousness. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine upon us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give you thanks. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Our second reading is from John's Gospel, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, 
I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus appears to Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The purpose of John's Gospel. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, 
O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Sometimes the reality of our lives is too much for us to cope with. We just want to run away and hide, lick our wounds. I suspect we can all admit to feeling like that at one time or another. But in doing that, we are shutting the door on life. We, in fact, are imprisoning ourselves from reality. And that is what is happening to the disciples in today's reading. They are hiding for fear of the Jews, but maybe also of God. They had, after all, denied knowing Jesus. So, they are not just fearful, but possibly also full of guilt. Reality for them is frightening. Jesus is dead. They had witnessed his crucifixion. So they are gathered together in a room, a locked room, completely traumatised by events, hiding from everyone, shutting themselves away from reality. But hadn't Mary Magdalene announced that, that she had seen Jesus, that he had spoken to her, that he was risen? But even being aware of these things couldn't make them any less fearful. They are too locked in their fear and doubt to open their minds to any hope or to joy. Their faith is weakened. The locked room, in fact, has become their tomb, closed to the outside world. Can we perhaps associate ourselves to the feelings of the disciples? Are we locked up in some way? What causes us to be so? Questions on our faith, perhaps. Sorrow or loss, anger, resentment, and willing to change or to be open to new ideas. I'm sure we all at times have such feelings. Allowing Jesus into the locked places in our lives can help. He can offer us the peace we require and the strength to go forward. Jesus always knows what we need and he knew what the disciples needed after the crucifixion. So he appears before them into that locked room, demonstrating that neither a stone tomb nor a locked door can defeat him. Peace be with you, he tells them, and proceeds to show them his hands and his side. He's clearly recognisable to the disciples. And suddenly, the reality of the resurrection is clear to them. His wounds confirm it. Jesus is risen indeed. He is here with them. The fear and the doubt disappear, to, re to be replaced by belief, joy and hope. Peace be with you, he says. They are forgiven. How wonderful that makes them feel. And furthermore, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. From being afraid of life, they receive new life. But one disciple is not there in the room. Thomas is not there. Why is he not there with the others? We don't really know. Perhaps he is so grief stricken that he needs to be alone needs his own space. So when the others tell him that they have seen Jesus, he doesn't believe them. Well, I suspect that we wouldn't either. We too might need to see for ourselves. Thomas is perhaps feeling confused and even perhaps a little hurt. If what they say is true, why didn't Jesus wait for him to be out there amongst them? Surely Jesus knows how much he loves him and how greatly he's grieving for him. So, feeling like that, Thomas tells the disciples that he will not believe in the resurrection unless he can see Jesus for himself and touch the wounds on his body. I wonder if Thomas feels a little ashamed of himself for not believing what the disciples are telling him. 
Why can't he just accept what the others say? Why does he doubt? What has happened to his faith? Doubt and faith. How close are they? According to Paul Tillich, a Lutheran pro Protestant theologian of the 20th century, doubt is not the opposite of faith, but rather it is an element of faith. The following week, the disciples are gathered once again in the same room, and this time Thomas is one of their number. Despite his feelings of rejection, he has not cut himself off from them. I suspect he wants and needs to believe and hopes that Jesus will appear to them once again. And so he does. Jesus tells Thomas to place his hands on the wounds on his body. Thomas does. And immediately all doubt leaves him. My Lord and my God, he says. Do you believe because you see me, Jesus asks him. How happy are those who believe without seeing me? It is difficult not to feel sorry for Thomas. He was asked to do what the other disciples hadn't had to do, to believe without seeing. I suspect that any of the other disciples might have reacted in the same way as Thomas. But Thomas is the one with the doubting label attached to his name. But in doubting, Thomas has merely shown human frailty and in doing so exhibits just how close perhaps is the connection between doubt and faith. And surely when we doubt, it is not a sign that we are non-believers, but rather that we are allowing ourselves to be honest, that our faith at times can be shaken. Alfred Lord Tennyson is quoted as saying that there lives more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. Thomas is honest. He does not pretend to believe. He just needs to be sure. But when he is sure, he goes the whole way. My Lord and my God, he says. He surrenders completely. And his desire to know Jesus for himself not only brings him faith, but the strength to take the message to others. For he goes on to spread the word in India. A faith like that of Thomas is surely better than a glib profession. It has more substance to it. Thomas doubts, yes, but more importantly, when he believes, he helps many others to believe as well. This, I think, is what is important about Thomas. Not the fact that he has doubts, but the fact that when he does become sure, he surrenders completely and lives his faith every day of his life. Doubt is part of the human condition and can affect all of us, even the most saintly of us. Both Mother Teresa of Calcutta and Pope Pope Francis had confessed to having struggled with doubt and faith throughout their lives. In 1953, Mother Teresa writes in some of her most intimate correspondence of how she has struggled with doubt at various times in her life. And in, her interview, in an interview in 2013, Pope Francis speaks about his personal doubt. It is part of life's journey, he says, and we must not feel condemned that it is part of being human. We must trust God and have the courage to ask for help. Marty Hogan, an American composer of liturg liturgical music, has written the following verses inspired by 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. For our life is a matter of faith, not of sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. No gracious words we hear of him who spoke as none e'er spoke, but we believe him near. We may not touch his hands and sight, nor follow where he trod, 
yet in his promise we rejoice and cry, my Lord and God. Help then, O Lord, our unbelief, and may our faith abound to call on you when you are near and seek where you are found. That when our life of faith is done in realms of clearer light, we may behold you as you are in full and endless sight. Let us pray. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us riches beyond measure. We can only return a fraction of what we owe you. But we ask, Lord, that you will bless our offerings of money and of ourselves and help us to use them wisely in your service and for your glory. Loving God, you know and understand all the worries and fears that we bring with us today, the thoughts and concerns that burden us and weigh us down. In the stillness of this sanctuary, we offer them to you now, believing that we can leave them in your loving hands. Heavenly Father, you know that like Thomas, we can be overcome by doubts. Our faith can be fickle and our loyalty fleeting, yet you continue to love each one of us exactly as we are. And no matter how feeble, you can use each one of us in your service. Lord, as we enjoy the blessing of your love, hear us as we pray for others and open our hearts to show them that same compassion and love. During these very difficult times, so many in our own community are struggling financially with the rising cost of everyday essentials and are fearful for the days ahead. Father, be close to them in their despair and help us to reach out in love, helping in whatever way we can. Heavenly Father, hear us as we think of those around this world of ours where there is war or disaster of one kind or another. Loving God, we feel so helpless, not knowing what to do or even what to pray for. But you know the needs of all your people and with you we believe that all things are possible. Lord God, we remember those around us in this congregation and in the wider community who need your love and comfort. Those who are lonely or depressed, who are worn out by worry or caring responsibilities, those who are ill or dying, those who mourn a loved one, people who are homeless, or discriminated against in some way. Lord, as we seek to care for them, be with us in all that we say, think and do. 
so that they will not see us, but will see you in us. Lord, hear our prayers as we offer them in the name of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us go forth in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, rest upon and remain with us all, now and always.